One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. A common conception held by many a maker of hard cider is that the quality of the resultant product is largely a function of the quality of the starting must, also known as juice. For many traditionalists, the process of obtaining said juice involves picking apples with largely unfamiliar names, pressing the fruit to release its sweet liquid, then fermenting it, sometimes naturally. Then there are those who prefer taking a, well, a more simple route. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this episode to talk about the blasphemous method method of using cheap store-bought apple juice when making hard cider as contributor will level you know when i think of cider i like to think of like a fall day where i'm like walking through an apple orchard and we're like picking apples and we get to go get some fresh pressed juice at the end um, but unfortunately i live in texas and that's just not much of an option so i'm happy to talk about alternatives to that yeah, absolutely. I had my first experience with hard cider quite a few years ago. Uh, I can't recall exactly when, but I know it was before I had kids. So, I mean, 15, 16 years ago, a friend of ours brought over uh, some commercial canned ciders, which I had not seen up until that point. I forget the brand. It was probably Strongbow or something like that. But what I do remember is thinking that it really wasn't my jam. Uh, I, rem- I remember them being super dry and almost tasting more like a sparkling wine rather than apple cider, which is what I was expecting. Uh, I would just rather have had beer is what I I recollect uh, about that moment. It wasn't until a few years later that I decided to try my hand at making a cider because my brother-in-law was begging me to do that. Uh, And that was inspired again. Also, you know, in in addition by my wife's distaste for beer and hope that, hey, if I have five gallons of this stuff, I can appease those uh, who may not like beer so much. Uh, I did decide to take more of a lazy approach, if that's what we want to call it. And when I told others about the fact that I just fermented store-bought apple juice, the reactions were largely, um, well, not positive. We'll just put it that way. I am definitely looking forward to talking with you about this stuff today, Will. All right. If you like what we're up to and you want us to keep doing it, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy. Uh, by committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, <laughs> unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up in January of 2020, is the guy behind the best brewing magazine of all time, (laughs) Brew Your Own Magazine, as well as Winemaker Magazine, Brad Ring. Anyone involved in brewing knows about Brew Your Own Magazine, which is published by Battenkill Communications, a company that Brad is the president of. Also, uh, Brad hosts the annual Brew Your Own Boot Camp, which I had the pleasure of speaking at in 2019. Uh, And he also does other really cool events like European Bicycle Beer Tours. To be a part of this session, you have to make your pledge of just $3 or more at patreon.com slash brewlosophy no later than Friday, January 26, 2024, as Brad's going to be taking questions that Saturday, the 27th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate it immensely. Uh, not only does that help those who haven't heard of us yet to more easily find the show, but it's also nice uh, for us to know what you think about how we're doing. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who in addition to having a remarkable YouTube channel chock full of great brewing related content, sell what we believe to be some of the best electric brewing systems on the market. If you've been thinking about getting into an electric system, moving over from propane to electric, you owe it to yourself to check out Clawhammer Supply. Uh, Whether you're after a 120 volt 5 gallon unit or something bigger like their powerful 240 volt 10 gallon 
system, Clawhammer has got you covered. Learn more about everything they have to offer at clawhammersupply.com. And don't forget to check out their YouTube channel as well. Listener Jimmy K from New Zealand wrote in with a comment after hearing us respond to another question on our latest Brew in A episode. Jimmy said, I agree with your comments around the attitude of some homebrewers. Sometimes I seriously think I don't want to be known as a homebrewer anymore and don't often mention that I do it. Uh, People need to pull way back. Importantly, I don't know about in the United States, but in New Zealand and around other countries, there's less and less accessible homebrew clubs. Time restraints and the fact the internet has so much information on brewing means people don't need to go to clubs to learn. Uh, I've never been a member of a homebrew club simply because there's not one very close to me anymore. I wish there was. Uh, That hands-on experience surely beats sitting on a couch and watching someone else do it. Well, you know, as someone who's on the leadership team of the brew club, I think there's a whole lot of value in what the internet has out there. Um, but the the thing, the reality is, is that we talk about beer all the time on the brew club. We have very active discord. We have a very active Facebook page, um, but you can't really get that in-person feedback without having in-person people to actually try your beer. So someone can <laughs> describe to me all day, Hey, I have this beer. I think I'm tasting this, da, 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 da. But it, it is a real value if you can find that local group or just even a local group of friends that can form your own kind of club of sorts just to get together try try each other's beer it it really can be a great resource i understand that with the internet maybe learning uh maybe not as as useful as it used to be but definitely worth having some people in your area that you can like you know hey try this beer i trust your palate what do you think um you know if you're competing what category should it go in um you know what what can i do to maybe make some tweaks to it and and it's really helpful to have those kind of people around as and help you grow as a brewer yeah i don't disagree with that will uh and t- you know i'm reading through this and it seems to me like jimmy hit on a few things in this comment the first one being his view on the attitudes of home brewers in general i definitely get where he's coming from and uh, my hope is that the greater population of home brewers recognizes that this kind of entitled or elitist attitude that some homebrew, I don't know if you've recognized this, Will, but it's certainly something that I've seen over the years, particularly as, uh, you know, brewlosophy has become more and more of a thing. I, I just don't think that that's a very welcoming approach. You know, it tends to push people away more than it does draw them in. Um, you know, and as fans of this hobby, I, I think that we'd want, you know, um, uh, one of those over, over the other, you know, that, that, Maybe some people disagree, but that we want to draw people in and not exclude people. Um, and I just think that, you know, again, that attitude of like, oh, we're better than than your craft beer or non-craft beer drinkers, I should say. Or, oh, if you drink Bud Light, then, oh, geez, you're so bad. I don't I just don't think that's going to work. And I've, I feel like I've belabored that point. Um, as far as the paucity of homebrew clubs uh, or the apparent growing lack of interest in membership, whatever it is, I can't help but think that it's related in, to the general lull in homebrewing overall. But maybe it is something else. I don't know. Maybe it's some combo of all of these things. But if people aren't brewing, why are they going to go to a homebrew club is kind of my, my thinking. The unfortunate... Uh, consequence of that is that some of the smaller clubs out there that were incredibly beneficial to those who were members, you know, prior to COVID or prior to this lull are unfortunately just not going to be able to sustain. So hopefully those members are friends and they can at least hang out in a non, you know, a non-official way. Um, but that's kind of what, that's kind of what I'm seeing is that just, you know, you, you, you've, you've got less and less people brewing these days, which means less and less people going to clubs. I don't know. What do you think, Will? Um, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, on, on the first point though, I've totally gone with a homebrew club things and, and drank the Miller light at the homebrew club party. <laughs> just, just so that the, the random person that wasn't necessarily like in the club, but was there could just see that not all of us are, uh, pretentious and assuming. So I, I do get a lot of crap that when I drink Lone Star at Miller light at a homebrew club uh, event, but you know, whatever, different strokes, different folks. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, I think COVID, I think a lot of things kind of made us a little bit more isolated for better or for worse. And I, I do think it's just kind of maybe a decline in the hobby, maybe a, a, an increase. You know, there's a lot of, I guess, hypotheticals around why they're shrinking. But, um, you know, as, as this hobby kind of shrinks and hopefully we're, we're seeing the plateau on the, the, the floor of that soon, uh-huh. um, you know, I, I think again, these homebrew clubs, these in-person events, these in-person things are, are going to shrink as well. And so we kind of need to create clubs around maybe homebrewers and beer enthusiasts just to kind of promote interest and kind of have a camaraderie together. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what the brew club does, right? I mean, it's it's not in person, um, but, but you guys have come up with some really cool 
uh, I guess, projects that really does keep everybody involved. There's beer exchanges, there's stuff like that. So, you know, it's about as good as it's going to get without, you know, actually meeting face to face with people. And, you know, on the Miller, we talk about Miller Lite all the time. And honestly, if they wanted to sponsor us, we'd probably say yes, we love that stuff. But, you know, I've heard the argument before. Well, it ha- you know, even if you suspend the arguments against the quality of that beer, which anybody who says that that's a bad beer, I, I just can't understand. I feel like they're biased. Um, but it's their marketing practices or it's the fact that they're, you know, a big conglomerate, they're commercial and that they're taking money that should be going to craft brewers. I, you know, that that's like the whole Walmart argument of 10 years ago when P, oh, you can't shop there, they're still in the mom and pops and a lot of people, that's all they can afford and they have to do that. Well, my thinking is even if that's the case, you, <laughs> by pushing people away who are focused specifically on wanting that style of beer, regardless of where the money is going, you're not going to bring them into the hobby by making them sound, feel like fools for enjoying what they enjoy. I guess that's the part that I, I don't get. And yes, I don't care about the money piece of it. If you are a craft brewer and you're making good beer, you're getting my money as well. That's not, it's not like I, I only have this limited pot and it goes one direction or the other. I do both, baby. That's my thing. So uh, I really do think there's just this kind of fun thing that some people, at least uh, you know, people from yesteryear at least, uh, kind of have in like damning the man type of deal. And I, I'm just not into that either. So anyways, we're going off on tangents. It's easy to do when it comes to this topic. Jimmy, thank you for reaching out to us. We always appreciate hearing from uh, folks like you and different opinions on these matters. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. If you've yet to experience the absolute awesomeness that is the Brewlosophy show, go check it out right now. You can pause this episode, open up your web browser and go Go to youtube.com slash at the brewlosophy show or just search for brewlosophy on YouTube and you'll find it. Martin is absolutely killing it and we are confident you're going to think so as well. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on making hard cider with uh, cheap juice. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super-efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com, and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. I don't think anyone listening to this show is going to disagree that for the most part, human beings love booze and we're going to find a way to turn whatever we can get our hands on into something alcoholic that makes us feel, you know, good. (laughs) Such is certainly the case when it comes to cider, uh, which records indicate was being produced by ancient Egyptians over 3000 years ago. To me, that's crazy, man. You know, um, those Egyptians, they, they had some things going on, you know, with, uh, <laughs> with, with the fermenting of, of various things. Um, but, but ciders are really kind of exciting. I mean, um, fruit's been around for a long time, and we know that cider's an alcoholic beverage that's made from fruit, and in our case, typically apples. But, you know, people have been fermenting fruit and making lots of beverages with it for a very long time, and the Egyptians are just in a long line of, of historical examples. Exactly, exactly. And w- one thing that was interesting to me, over here in the United States, or, or maybe Maybe it was just in my little enclave of America. Uh, we always referred to cider as something that you drank like, you know, in, around the holidays uh, and it was warmed up and you'd put mulling spices in it. And that was apple cider. Uh, and so we designated the alcoholic version as 
hard cider. Well, I I was taught by a prior contributor, Matt Del Fiaco, who actually really is into cider and goes out and gets, you know, apple juice from fresh pressed farms, uh, you know, at once a year and makes makes a, a legit cider, if you will, that when you say cider, uh, that actually denotes that it is hard, that it has alcohol in it. And I thought that was an interesting little lesson. Uh, I actually went to Wikipedia when I was prepping for this just to confirm. And sure enough, if you if you look up cider, it says that it is an alcoholic beverage made from the fermented juice of apples. Ah, interesting little tidbit. Either way, if we if we say hard cider, we're referring, or, or even just cider, we're referring to the boozy stuff. <laughs> yeah, the, the other term I've heard uh, several times over is like cider beer, which is, you know, cider, it's definitely different from beer, but I think it's just people, because, um, you know, if you're getting strong boats in a can, it's carbonated, you drink it like you would a beer, uh, you know, so, so that's kind of a, an interesting thing. But obviously cider, like we said, it comes from fruit and beer would use, you know, uh, malt, yeah. malted barley or some kind of malted uh, grain. Yeah. So uh, now a little disclaimer. We are brewers. We focus heavily on beer brewing. Uh, that's that's I would think you would agree with me there, Will. Uh, but we both dabble in cider making and, and, and other fermented beverages. But as it pertains to this show and this specific episode, I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go, if it's going to be long, if it's going to be shorter than usual. So give us a little leeway here. We I want to start, though, by talking about uh, traditional cider making. And this is where this is what I'm talking about is uh, it, to make cider doesn't require nearly as many steps as it does to make a batch of beer. Uh, traditionally, what we, at least based on what I'm reading and what I've heard from more cider-making purists, is you, you go to a farm, you get apples, you take those apples and you press them to release their juices, and then you allow whatever yeast was on those skins to ferment that juice. And uh, there you go. You got your cider. So there's no mash step. There's no boil. There's not, nothing like that. Now, obviously, some people have, I think, modern-day this is going to sound weird, but like modern day traditionalists, uh, some of them prefer, you know, the, the control of pitching a, uh, a, a lab culture, you know, that's been clean and, and knowing more predictably what the outcome is going to be when you use that culture culture to ferment the, the juice. Uh, and so that's, that's cool and that's fine. But I've had a number of uh, ciders that were just naturally fermented, um, you know, from the field and they are phenomenal. I mean, I, I've never made one cause I don't have access where I live is kind of like where you live, even though I'm in California, it, it's really hot here. Uh, and so you need to have, I, I believe in order for these, you know, apples to grow properly, you have to have a nice freeze during the winter months. Uh, we don't really get that in Fresno here, but, uh, but man, if I, if I could get my hands on some fresh juice and just let it naturally ferment, those have been some of the best ciders that I've had. I'll be honest. As, as I've said earlier, uh, at the, the top of the show, like I, I've romanticized about like, you know, walking through an apple orchard and picking apples and then going to a press and pressing them it all sounds pretty fantastic and and you could see where like you know if you're you know way back before you knew much about microbiology or you know maybe before the microscope was invented you you would just having this like yeast on the skins to ferment it it's kind of like an all-in-one packaged kind of beverage at this point it's super easy to make alcohol that way which obviously as human beings were driven to do that so uh for whatever reason <laughs> so um so it's really cool that you can just go through and then everything you need to make cider it's is technically there but you can see from the the aspects of you know companies out there um like austin i think it's austin east ciders or um you know strongbow or some of those guys how they would want to have a little more control over this process get a little bit more consistent product because you don't always have that much control over kind of what yeast is going to be present there and what kind of acidity you're going to be getting and, and maybe you need to blend different kinds of apples to get the, the flavor and the tartness that you're wanting absolutely absolutely and i and i that's we're going to move into that piece of it because obviously when it comes to cider the the you know the star of the show is the apple. It's the fruit that you're using uh, to extract that juice and then fermenting it. And so there are a few things. I mean, quite a few things that uh, cider makers take into consideration when it comes to making a batch. And I, I will say, a lot of the terminology aligns with. Uh, cider's probably closest cousin, which is wine, right? It's your wine is just fermented grape juice. Cider is just fermented apple juice. So there's certain things that carry over and, and understandably so. Uh, so one of the big things that cider makers are going to focus on is the acidity of the juice from the apple, from the particular apple. And I promise we'll get into uh, apple varieties and such like that in a minute. Um, but there are certain apple varieties, you know, different apple varieties have different levels of acidity, meaning that uh, lower pH uh, in that apple variety 
variety is going to result in a more tart uh, flavor. And to, to make it very simple, if you've ever tasted a Granny Smith apple next to, say, a Gala apple, you know what I'm talking about. That Granny Smith is more tart, has a lower pH. It's, a, it's got a higher acidity than, say, a Gala apple, which is more sweet. Um, the, the, some other benefits to uh, a, a, apples that have a higher acidity is that that acidity, just like with brewing, it can discourage contamination by unwanted microbes and prolong the shelf life by which I read that means that it will prolong the lighter color of that cider. When we think of, I don't know about you, Will, but when I think of like beer, pale lagers getting darker, my mind goes immediately to oxidation. If you've ever cut an apple in half and set it out on a counter, it doesn't take very long for it to start to oxidize and turn brown. And I, I, it sounds to me like lower or higher acidity, so lower pH apple juices will will actually, uh, pro, again, prolong the the that color, that desirable pale color that that you expect in a cider yeah i don't think it's by accident that they add ascorbic acid to apple juice to keep the shelf life up on the shelves there and and, right and help the color so you know obviously uh and also that 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 acidity like as far as you know it it is a desirable trait though when you're drinking a cider at least to me like i you know maybe i don't want like a sour bomb like the crazy sour ale that i had last week um but you know that that nice little acidity that nice little tartness you know that just kind of gives gives you that that feeling of drinking cider and so maybe I don't want it over the top, but it is definitely a uh, flavor impact there that I want to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing, and almost to balance this out, I think these three components actually serve kind of work together, interchange, not interchangeably, but but as kind of to create this one big gestalt, right, is the sweetness or the sugar level of the apple. Um, and that's, again, that's just a measure or of the percentage of the juice that is made up of sugar. You've got uh, most table apples or the apples that you're used to finding at the grocery store are higher in sugar and uh, have either moderate to, to high acidity. So that's like your granny smell. Smith. Um, and then the final thing is the tannin uh, piece of it. And I, this is an interesting one that does, again, this makes me think far more of winemaking than it does of brewing. Uh, we talk about tannins a little bit in brewing. Usually it's something to be avoided at all costs, whereas you, it is not the case with cider. You want to have a certain amount of tannin because in addition to you know giving you that kind of expected dry puckering mouthfeel that you that you get from a nice white wine or a cider, it also adds body and substance to the cider um, and can help to balance again that sugar and that acid uh, to bring everything all together to create uh, well arguably subjectively um, a, a, a preferable product in the end. Right. And, and like you said, all three of these things kind of act in concert with one another. I mean, we, we really missed an opportunity. If we'd gone sugar, acidity, tannin, we could have used sat as like a little, you know, kind of wordplay here. But um, <laughs> anyways, uh, not not really relevant. But, but you know, with tannins, again, you know, with the sugar, with the acidity, these all kind of work in concert with one another. And they're all your pretty three basic levers for flavor here to kind of play with what kind of flavor profile you're going to have with this finished product. Yeah, and so in thinking about those flavor profiles, um, there are two main cider apple categorization systems out there, at least that I could find, and they're both regionally based, arguably two regions that are well known for their cider histories uh, and and making this delicious alcoholic beverage. Uh, The first one is British, the second one is French. Overall, they are largely similar. We are gonna focus primarily on the British categorization system here because we don't need to, you know, uh, talk about this as deeply as they're basically the same. Uh, I think the one thing the French categorization uh, system employs is a talk about the actual sugar levels and sweetness, uh, whereas the the British categorization system focuses more just on the acidity and the tannin as a me- and that kind of contributes to different levels of sweetness. Um, again, we're not experts on this, but this is basically what it is. Um, the British system has has a uh, four different levels. Have you heard of these? Will I, these are I learned this as I was prepping for this show. So so first before we move on too far, um, you know you talk about the the French ones uh, being more about sugar. Um, I what I will say because I I got to spend some time in Normandy a few years ago on a vacation. Um, we lived in Europe for a few years, as most people know if they've listened to the show, and I've talked about it. Um, but in Normandy, they don't actually have like a, a wine making tradition. They make apples, and so you get a lot of apple brandy and a lot of ciders. And their ciders there are delicious, but they are super dry. You can tell that they use sugar and then they dry it out, and then the carbonation is like 
super effervescent, like almost like brute kind of uh, champagne kind of carbonation in some of those things. And and it's absolutely a, a joy to go drink some of that stuff. If you're ever in Normandy, France, highly recommend it. Um, you'll find it everywhere. They they even had like some mussels that they steamed in cider, which were very delicious. Like you get the sweetness from the the apples inside of the mussels, and it's just a really nice combo. Mm. Um, so so when you talk about that sugar level with French, yes, they they seem to be much drier. Uh, at least the ones I've had, and who knows, I may have gotten bad ones from whatever grocery store we went to because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> uh, but that they were very dry and very good. But like with the British one, I, I do agree that like I I don't know that I've heard these categories so to speak like the bittersweet, bitter sharp, sharp and sweet that you have listed here. Um, but it makes a lot of sense to me that that it would be categorized in this way. Yeah, it, they I like categorizations. I'm, I'm not not necessarily that I. I employ them in my daily life, but it does help to kind of uh, keep things organized. And uh, f- so for the British categorization system, to just to be really quick with this, there's bittersweet, as I mentioned earlier, which is low acidity with higher tannins. Example, uh, you know, Apple examples include Chisel, Jersey, Ellis, Bitter, and Yarlington. I have not heard of any of those in my daily life. Uh, there, The next category is bitter sharp, which is high acidity and tannin. Uh, examples are Kingston Black and Porter's Perfection. Again, never heard of those. Uh, sharp is the next category. So you got Bittersweet, Bitter Sharp, Sharp, which is high acidity with low tannin. Uh, these are apples like Harrison, Wixen, Hughes, Virginia Crab. Uh, my understanding is that most of the apples that would be in the sharp category are uh, or like crab apples would would definitely be in the sharp category. I have definitely bitten a crab apple before, and I would not recommend anybody. And you know, it's not a terribly enjoyable experience. Uh, and then finally, you got sweet, and these are the ones that I'm familiar with, right? Low acidity, low tannin. Uh, examples include Gala, Honey Crisp, most of your table apples. Uh, I think even Granny Smith, as acidic as that is, it's not to the point of being acidic enough to be uh, sharp, right? It's still sweet enough. It's balanced and, and has that. Now, all of these can be used to make cider on their own, but I think most hardcore cider makers are blending juices from various types of apples, and I don't think they're using too much sweet. I think they're sticking with the bittersweet, bitter sharp, and sharp uh, to create the profile that they, you know, the flavor profile that they so desire. And um, again, I've had a few uh, ciders made using these types of methods, and they they taste way different different than the stuff I make at home, but they taste good, you know? Yeah. Um, I, first off, I want to just make sure people know, like when we're talking about the chisel jerseys and the Kingston's and finally the gal and the honey crisp, those, you know, those are all apple varieties, not like any kind of brand of cider that you need to go out and try to right. find. <laughs> right. and, and, and honestly, like the only ones I've ever heard of were the ones that you, you did that were table apples, like the gala and the honey crisp and granny Smith, because those are the ones that you can actually find at the store. But, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't think, um, uh, you know, many people are, are finding those other apples on shelves too much. They're probably very specific for this, um, you know, and they're probably blending all these things together to get that profile, which again, kind of like mixtures of grains is kind of a way to, to, you know, make a, a beer recipe again, kind of blending these juices and, and blending them in such a way where you can get that balance of that, uh, that sugar, get a balance of those tannins, get a balance of that acidity and come out with a product that can be kind of consistent year to year. Because again, apples are, are going to change flavor profiles a little bit year to year as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the idea, the whole blending thing. I mean, um, my understanding is that most, again, heart, more hardcore, like dedicated cider makers are blending the juices first and then fermenting it. Uh, and a big thing is balancing that tannin that sweetness and that acid, right? And and so making sure that the juice has all of those things before you ferment it. Though I'm sure there are those out there who are doing it post fermentation. They'll ferment them on this, you know, separately and then blend them back together to create their their product or or a variety of products, uh, which I think is rad as well. Now we talked a little bit about the traditional approach, which does not vary all too differently from modern cider making approaches. Uh, the biggest difference is that rather than going to a farm and getting fresh pressed juiced, fresh fresh pressed juice, where you kind of have to live near an orchard and and able to be able to do that. You got a lot of people these days who are purchasing juice uh, from various sources, um, uh, whether that, you know, ranging from farms who sell it online, who will ship it out to you, uh, to homebrew shops who have pasteurized juices that you can then take and ferment on your own, to going to Walmart uh, and (laughs) buying juice off the shelf. Uh, You know, the the ability that we have because of controlled packaging processes and, and stuff like that is pretty cool to be able to ferment these things at home. So, 
Uh, but but I guess when, when we talk about like modern cider making, we're just talking about using juices that has already been pressed and pasteurized. Um, the the big con that I've heard related to this is is mainly that in doing this, you are typically sticking with a very specific variety of apple. Even if it's an apple juice blend, it's usually all from the, if you're buying it from the grocery store, it's usually all of this sweet categorization uh, right. class, right? And and so you can lack a little bit of complexity uh, in doing it that way. Yeah, uh, and you don't have any control over like what apples they're putting into those juices and blending in. Most of the time when you read the labels, like, you know, the hardest part of my cider making day is just the drive to the grocery store. And when you're looking at those labels at the uh, whatever brand of juice you're getting, like you don't really, maybe it lists a few, but um, even regionality, like sometimes there'll be sales like, you know, juice from China and or Poland. And you're like, okay, uh, sure, Poland and Chinese apples sound great. I don't have any choice. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and here's the thing. I, I spent a good 20 minutes trying to find where the, you know, we're going to talk about the experiment here in a minute, where the juice uh, or the, you know, the apples that produced that juice came from, what the variety of apples, it doesn't say, it just says like throughout the year, it's a blend of, of apples from these regions or whatever. It doesn't. So the, the, the assumption, I think probably an accurate assumption is that they are sweet table apples where they're getting that because that's, what's familiar to our palates. And that's what we, we want a juice that tastes like the apples that we're eating. So that's, I think that's, that's probably the case. And if you talk again to dedicated cider people, they're telling you, hey, that, that's great. You can make cider like that, but you're not making the best cider that has this complex blend of other stuff going on. You're basically making fermented, you know, table apple juice, which, yeah, you know, call it Pruno, call it whatever you want, hooch. Uh, that, that's, that's kind of what it is. So now there are different juice types. And this is where we get to the kind of the, the, the meat of our talk here is that uh, if you are going to, to uh, the, use the approach of going to the store and picking up some apple juice, uh, you know, when I first started poking around with this idea, the recommendations I got were, well, definitely don't get that cheap, clear stuff off the shelf. What you want is an unpassed or, a, you know, a non, uh, you don't want preservatives. So no preservative, preservatives in there, minimal processing, you know, as fresh pressed as possible. It should be hazy. It should look, you know, different than that stuff that you drink when you were a kid, right? Um, so those are unfiltered, you know, if they're pasteurized, it's usually heat pasteurization. I have actually seen uh, non-pasteurized ciders or like apple juice cider, they call it cider, at the store. And it has a very, very low shelf life. And it's like once you open it, you got to get rid of it. You got to drink it because it will start to ferment, right? Or that's the concern. Um, so there are, you know, there are these options out there that are like that. Again, I think most of them are still made from your typical table apples. Uh, the the alternative is that cheap clear apple juice that you can get for like two fifty three bucks for a half gallon at any grocery store. It's a great value if you go to the right store. Well, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? You you might end up finding the best yet. Uh, who knows how that works? But um, these are also made from the same apples. Typically, they are filtered for clarity. So any of that, you know, what what people often associate filtration with like an absence of uh, of complexity or whatever. So maybe that's the case. The other, the other interesting point is that these filtered, clear, cheap apple juices are often made from concentrate, meaning that it was, they, they first got the juices from the apples, filtered it, did all that, and then, and then somehow condensed it down to a very thick syrup that they usually freeze and that you can buy and mix with water, <laughs> reconstitute it with water and make apple juice at home. Well, and, and that, that makes a ton of sense though, right? Cause uh, you know, again, on the last one I did, I think the, the, the great value juice I got from Walmart said, you know, this is from Poland and China. Well, they probably concentrated it in Poland and China respectively or wherever it was. And then, you know, again, you're shipping less weight cause you don't want to just ship a lot of random water when you can condense it down, concentrate it down. And now you're saving on shipping, you're saving on space. So it makes a lot of sense that they do it this way. But I do see the argument that you could be losing a little bit of something, something in the process, because again, you're, you're getting more heat involved. You're getting more, uh, more processing involved, right? It makes sense to me as well. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that I, I'm going to buy into it, but it, it would make sense if that's the case. Now, one of the things that you want to keep in mind or that I was implored to keep in mind when I started going down the cheap juice path was, well, hey, make sure it does not have specific preservatives. You want to stay away from any preservatives if you can, but you know, a little ascorbic acid or vitamin C, that's not too big of an issue. But if it has 
potassium metabisulfite or, or benzoates, a sodium benzoate, those can actually retard fermentation, uh, making it such that you don't fully attenuate, uh, the, you know, that cider when you're fermenting it. So those are things I've, I've not messed with that, uh, experimentally yet or anything like that. I always just get juice that has ascorbic acid. I don't know if, I don't know if any of the grocery stores around me have juices that have anything but that, and it has never been an issue. So I just wanted to touch on that. You can go to like Trader Joe's and get their, you you know, higher end uh, apple juice that that looks way different, and I, I don't I don't believe I think it's just heat pasteurized. It doesn't have any of the other stuff. So yeah, I think I think his heat pasteurization is the way they get around that. They don't need to use the chemicals, and it's probably cheaper just to heat it up than it is to add all that other stuff. Right, exactly, exactly. So how do you make cider? This is going to be so quick. You go to the store, you buy your juice, you pour that juice into a sanitized fermentation vessel. I would recommend adding yeast nutrient. Uh, that is another experiment that we have done and may talk about again in the future on this show. But add a little bit of yeast nutrient uh, just to kind of give that yeast a fighting chance. You pitch your yeast and then you leave it alone. And the yeast you can use, you can use wine yeast. I think if you really want a dry, more wine-like or champagne-like cider in the end, then that's what you're gonna go with. Um, I've been told that most, you know, quote, cider yeasts that are out there are actually like English ale yeast, so you can get away with that. I've fermented so many batches with Saison yeast, and it works phenomenally well. So it's it, it's really fun. You have a lot of room to mess around and, and try new things. Um, and then once you're done fermenting it, once it's fully fermented out, you can make, you know, fruit additions or anything like that. Once it's done, you package it the same way you would a beer. I, rec- I like kegging it because I like to force carbonate mine. Uh, and you choose how you want uh, to carbonate your cider. And uh, I read on one one uh, like cider making website that they refer to this as texture, uh, not carbonation. It's the texture of the cider. So however you fancy. refer to it, yeah, it's so fancy. I bet it so was those fancy. French people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, there are three main uh, textures or carbonation levels. The first being still. I think we've all had still ciders before, um, and that just means there's minimal to no carbonation at all. Maybe a light, just a light prickliness. On your tongue. Uh, there's petalant, which is a moderate carbonation. Again, I think we've probably all experienced this. Even if you poured yourself a, a super carbonated batch and let it sit out for a little bit, it becomes petalant. Uh, and then there's my favorite, which is sparkling, and that's just high carbonation. I like my cider to be to range anywhere between champagne and soda in terms of the carbonation. I, I'm with you 100% there. I want it to be super sparkling. I want it to be really spritzy. I, I want it to just like shine. Uh, but but such on a few things like, you know, yeast nutrient. I know we're not going to go too deep into that, but I, I think as beer brewers, we're kind of spoiled because, um, you know, during a, a regular mash, like we kind of get a lot of the nutrients we need for those yeast to kind of thrive. Maybe we can add more and make it a little better. Yeah. But with things like cider and hard seltzer, you kind of need to add some of those things in there to get the yeast, the nutrients that they need. And you'll notice that things go a lot faster uh, if you do do that. Um, um, I know you and I both have probably made this with and without yeast nutrient. And I think we can both attest to the ones that we've done with yeast nutrient have gone way faster. And um, and again, yeast, uh, champagne yeast is great. Um, I know Imperial has bubbles, which I think is kind of an English strain. Uh, and then I know I'm with you, though. Bell Sison works great for all things intended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I lo- but the bubbles is amazing as well. To me, the bubbles results, it attenuates just as well as the Saison strains that I've used. And I've used um, uh, various liquid yeast uh, Saisons, uh, Saison strains, the, the, the dry Bell Saison is amazing. Bubbles uh, results in a, in a, in a, um, a product that finished cider that has a this perceptible sweetness. It's not sweet. I think it tastes sweet. more apple in the finished yeah, product. Yeah. And I think that apple-y thing kind of contributes kind of more of a, uh, a sweet character, uh, or at least the impression of sweetness. I love it. Uh, bubbles is amazing. Bell Saison's amazing. Um, but you, that's like you said, you can ferment with any number of yeast and create a good cider. Now I've made many batches of cider using the cheapest juice I could find on the grocery store shelves. And I'm not ashamed to say that I've had very good results. Naturally, when I let people know I was doing this by shamelessly putting publishing articles about it on the website. I received many a recommendation to quote, at least try an organic non-pasteurized juice instead of the cheap crap that you've been using. So I did. And as you might expect, I turned it into an experiment. Results from that when we're back from this break.
There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. I love beer, but sometimes I want something different, a drink that's crisp and refreshing with less, I don't know, beeriness to it. Uh, that's what ultimately inspired me to make my first cider, uh, which I did with five gallons of apple juice I had my wife pick up from Costco. I wasn't initially very hopeful based on the crap people were telling me uh, about this idea when I, when I proposed it, but lo and behold, it worked out great, and I've since made many, many more delicious batches using store-bought apple juice. Now, of course, there were some cider snobs out there. I say this lovingly as a, as a as a you know previous beer snob, I would say, uh, but they swore that I would prefer a batch made with quote better juice, by which they meant unfiltered with no preservatives. Now I will say when you know when I published the first uh, article about the hardberry cider that I made many many years ago. The, the comments weren't necessarily berating me. They were just saying, if you like that, you really should at least try going with an apple juice that is unpasteurized or unfiltered, um, you know, that doesn't have the, the preservative stuff like that. So I designed an experiment for uh, to, just to see how much I could tell these things apart. Um, what I did is I designed, I mean, you don't really design cider recipes when you're, when you're making them this way. They're very simple. Um, but I made two five-gallon batches of cider, one of which was made made with the cheapest filtered juice that I could find from my local grocery store. Uh, the brand was called Best Yet. Uh, I believe that, it, I, I think that's national at least in the United States, but maybe not. I've seen it on the most places on the West Coast. Uh, $3.56 per gallon at the time, which meant that this five-gallon batch cost me $17.80 uh, for, you know, for the juice alone. Not too bad. That's cheaper than if you were to go to the homebrew shop and buy you know, ingredients for a batch of beer, or right around the same at least. Um, now, the details about this juice that I bought, it was from concentrate, meaning that it was frozen and reconstituted with water at some point. It does not list the specific apple varieties that were used, but I'm guessing based on the fact that it, you know, it tasted very, very similar to a lot of the apples I eat, that it was some blend of Gala, Fuji, Granny Smith, and or Golden Delicious. I believe those four are the primary apples used for most apple juice sold in the United States, and it did have ascorbic acid as a preservative. Uh, the appearance of this stuff, it was golden and crystal clear. It smelled like I was five years old again, uh, and that is, you know, what I expect from regular apple juice. Um, now, uh, the other batch of cider was made with uh, a, a far more, uh, you know, relatively uh, expensive juice that I picked up from Trader Joe's. It was called Trader Joe's Organic Apple Juice. The price of this stuff was $7.98 per gallon, uh, which resulted in a five-gallon batch being $39.90, $21.10 more than the batch made with the cheap juice. I could have made more than two batches of the cheap version for the same price that it cost me to make this single batch using TJ's Organic Apple Juice. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if you've tried either of these juices on your own, Will, but to me, that price difference was pretty vast. Yeah, for, for double the money, you too can use Trader Joe's Organic Apple <laughs> Juice. Um, no, I, I've actually 
I, I don't know that I've seen Best Yet in markets around here. Um, it's possible that, you know, it just it, maybe it's a generic label that's different, but it's probably the same stuff that's in something around here. Yeah. But it seems like pretty much like what I have on the local store shelves, um, whether I went to Walmart or HEB or any of my local shops here. And then we have a Trader Joe's. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm fancy enough to call my uh, carbonation levels as textures. And I'm pretty sure I'm not fancy <laughs> enough to drink Trader Joe's uh, unfiltered uh, juice. But if somebody wants to buy me some, feel free and send it my way yeah <laughs> yeah i'm not you know what I'll, t- I'll be honest with you i'm not fancy enough to drink that eight dollar a gallon apple juice either uh but i did it for this experiment and I, I was actually hopeful that i would taste something different i you know you, they look these juices look vastly different um you know that the the cheap stuff is like i said golden and crystal clear uh this trader joe's stuff was kind of a browner color and opaque i mean you could not see through it uh definitely hazy right i'm looking at the photo right now and it it looks it looks a little gross because it's kind of like brownish and not see-through i'm I'm just gonna be honest so so i'm kind of yelling hey ma juice box yeah (laughs) yes i've never used mots but i've i have used treetop juice many many times to make cider as well works great uh now the stuff the, the the tj's cider or juice uh was not from concentrate meaning that it was pressed pasteurized likely by heat and then put into the package and uh, you know now it's shelf stable and they put it on the shelf no preservatives it's just juice they they actually brag about that on the packaging that there's nothing but juice in this package uh, it do, again it does not list the specific varieties of apples that were used but it does say that it was made with apples grown specifically in Washington and California both states that I've lived in for ample amounts of time uh, so it's very very likely that it was made using the same common table apples as the cheap juice used uh, and that's just because we know what's grown in these states and it is gala and fuji and granny smith and stuff like that so my guess is that these were made with likely a different blend but a similar uh, uh you know similar types of apple varieties uh for these i maybe they weren't though i don't know so um, I think so far the biggest benefit I've seen with the Trader Joe's stuff so far is, is at least you get like a source that's um, local to the United States anyways. Um, like I said, I know a lot of the stuff I see at Walmart or wherever, it, it's overseas kind of blends with of things just to make it as cheap as possible. So so I, I do think they're, you know, as much as I just bagged on it, uh, there is some value to, to buying something that's at least sourced locally, you know, at least in my opinion. Yeah, and you, I, I like Trader Joe's. I don't. I actually don't associate Trader Joe's with being like overly priced or whatever. But hey, you know they're they're getting this juice from American farms and uh, American processing plants and all of that stuff. So if that's your gig, then then by all means, I think eight dollars is is worth it. Fine. Uh, my my thing with this experiment was, uh, are, am I going to taste a difference when I ferment these two things out? So uh, now I did compare these juices prior to fermenting them just to see if. I could taste a difference of them alone. I did a couple triangle. T- I could not taste a difference in these ciders or in these in these juices. They tasted surprisingly similar to me when I couldn't see what they looked like. Now, of course, when I'm drinking them cited, that that hazy brownish colored Trader Joe's juice, I perceived it as being having like a thicker mouth feel and being more rich. But as soon as you cover that up. My brain couldn't tell them apart. Uh, they tasted incredibly, incredibly similar. Um, have you? I, I'm assuming you've at least sampled at some time some sort of a of a apple juice that wasn't just the clear, cheap stuff off the store shelf. Oh, oh yeah. So when uh, we lived in Germany, there were actual places with apple orchards, and you could get like kind of more fresh pressed, unpasteurized juices and stuff. And, and in your head, at least, it does seem to be a better product and and if nothing less like if you're in a place that it's local to and you're drinking it there the the experience is better so yeah, uh, and, yeah. and all that and all those things kind of relate into it so whether or not i would do a blind triangle test with the uh you know best yet or great value brand apple juice and be able to tell them part i i don't know i don't have that opportunity but maybe in the future i will take it <laughs> yeah you've got to have some cash in your wallet there will uh <laughs> so bring me the brew bucks marshall yeah that's right that's right making those big bucks you buy your expensive apple juice now uh so the fermentation process for these was very very simple i already walked you through it in the last segment Uh, i added half a teaspoon of y yeast yeast nutrient to 
uh, separate PET carboys. I poured five gallons of either juice into those carboys. Uh, the cheap juice OG was 1049, whereas the expensive Trader Joe's juice was at 1054 OG. So a difference of five specific gravity points. I think that's interesting. Uh, will it, you know, will, will you be able to taste that in the end? We'll just have to see. Uh, I then pitched one pouch of Lau Brew Bell Saison yeast into each of those batches. Uh, and then I filled, I placed the filled fermenters in the same fermentation chamber, which was controlled to 67 degrees Fahrenheit or about 19 degrees Celsius. Um, after 12 hours, I noticed that both of the batches of cider were, were had started fermenting at least. There was bubbles atop both, and they looked very similar. Obviously, the color difference was pretty stark, but besides that, the fermentation quality looked very similar. Until two days later, uh, at this point, the cider that I made with the cheap store-bought apple juice just had kind of small bubbles on the top. This is what I'm used to seeing when I make hard cider, whereas the one made with the more expensive unfiltered apple juice had a croisin on it that looked really similar to what you would see when making a batch of beer. I, th I was really curious about that, and I wondered if... Maybe the you know the filtering process for the cheap juice, uh, you know, strips it of some proteins and some other compounds that might contribute to the formation of that uh, of that croisin of that foam. And I wondered if you know in the end, are we going to see this in terms of the foam quality of the finished cider? I don't know. Yeah, that 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 it really is curious because you know normally when we see kind of that foamy stuff, we do think of kind of like more of a proteinaceous thing being in solution and kind of bubbling to the top. And so, uh, you know, may, maybe this is something that's going to go down the road have something to do with head retention, uh, yeah. mouthfeel, any of those things. You know, if there's more of that kind of proteinaceous stuff in suspension, could could affect those things. Makes sense to me. Uh, after about 10 days, the activity on both of those batches was all but absent. So I took hydrometer measurements that showed they both finished at 1.002. FG. Um, I thought that was interesting. So the attenuation on the expensive, you know, unfiltered uh, uh, juice batch was a little bit higher just because it had a higher starting gravity. But in the end, they finished it the same, um, resulting in the cheap juice batch having an ABV of 6.2% compared to 6.8% for the unfiltered, uh, more expensive juice batch. So a difference of 0.6%. Of I don't think that's anything that that is going to have a huge impact flavor wise, but maybe, yeah, that's, knows, you know, that's less than a percent. So, you know, kind of a function of the variable here. Cause obviously one was a little higher OG. So, uh, you know, I'm with you. I don't, I don't think that's really going to do much to affect the flavor of the end product here. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the same boat. So uh, I stabilized both of these with 0.5 teaspoons of potassium metabisulfite and then two and a half teaspoons of potassium sorbate. That is a, I have Drew Beecham to thank for that. I, I actually reached out to him uh, <laughs> when I was getting ready to, to package these, uh, not these ones, but my first cider. And he said, oh yeah, just do this every time you'll be good. Cause I wanted to back sweeten these. And so uh, I cold crashed both ciders to 34 degrees Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius for about 24 hours. And then I, uh, at kegging time, so they're both still in the fermentation vessel. At kegging time, I added, I, I obviously I sanitized the kegs, purged both with CO2 and then opened them and very gently added uh, three jars of apple juice concentrate. It was previously frozen. I let both defrost so that they were liquid, uh, but I added three of those to each keg, and then I racked the ciders, the respective ciders, on top of those uh, that apple juice concentrate into the kegs. Uh, I shook them up real well. Uh, as you, I've made the mistake of not doing that, and that really dense uh, apple juice concentrate will absolutely stay at the bottom of your keg, and that first pour, not very good. Uh, all you're drinking is apple juice concentrate. So, um, <laughs> Have you done that before? <laughs> Yeah, so um, definitely want to shake it. You want to make sure you get kind of a more of a homogenous solution in there because, uh, you know, you can drink apple juice uh, concentrate a lot easier if you just go buy it from the freezer section and drink it straight there. <laughs> you don't really necessarily want it in the bottom of your keg of cider. Yeah, I would not recommend going and just drinking super sweet apple juice concentrate, but it does make for a really good back sweetener. And I know there are and diabetes. Questions. And, and diabetes, yeah. But I know there are going to be some uh, some questions about my my opting to back sweeten this for the experiment. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, now, those kegs, once I shook them up and they were nice and homogenized, those kegs were placed in my keyser and burst carbonated at 50 PSI for 24 full hours. Again, I like my cider sparkling uh, before I re reduced the gas to 20 PSI, which is the serving pressure that I prefer uh, for my hard cider because I've got really long lines uh, that, that it, 
this works for that. If it may, you know, your mileage may vary. It may differ for you. So uh, I let those ciders condition for a little over a week, uh, at which point they were sparkling, mostly clear. Well, one of them was mostly clear <laughs> and ready to serve to tasters. Let's talk a little bit about the appearance. Will, I don't know. Do you have it up on your screen right now, what they look like? Man, I've been following along with your description for the, for the entire article, basically looking at the pictures and really from, from the uh, when they're sitting in the juice bottles to when they're like fermented out and you have them sitting side by side and all the way to the end product like the the um, best yet has that kind of nice uh, yellowish tint to it all the way through and then into your finished product is just like pretty much like Kolsch homebrew clear almost yeah yeah. you know you can see pretty well through it and then the Trader Joe's unfortunately it's just kind of a a murky mess throughout for lack of a better term like it's not not bad but you know it does still look kind of like a a hazy IPA that might have a slight bit of oxidation to it that's exactly what it looks like to me as well and it didn't taste oxidized I, I I will say that up front well, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not surprised that it's not oxidized because it has looked that way the entire way through. And, right. And, and you right. know, I'm not sure that ciders, I know they do oxidize, but I'm not sure they oxidize in the same way that, that hazy IPA does because that stuff's ridiculous. Um, but I'm just like, <laughs> it's an observation. If you go look up the article, if you go to philosophy.com and look up this article, um, you know, you do see this like kind of trend where the one is kind of bright yellow the entire time. The other one's just kind of this brownish murkiness uh, the entire time as well. So I'm not surprised at all by the end products here based off of what you started with and how it looked the whole process through. Yeah, and to and to circle back to the comment on the Croizen, uh, there was no difference in in foam quality whatsoever. They both poured with a similar color foam that dropped at a similar rate. They were, so that was I was kind of caught off guard by that, just based on the difference in the Croizen. So the the texture was identical, is what you're saying? <laughs> the the texture. Well, I don't know. Textures carbonation, not foam. But we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, <laughs> I did I did uh, carbonate them exactly the same, identically. I I've got a secondary regulator that makes it very easy for me to do that. So now out of six triangle uh, test attempts that I made, arguably biased, uh, I only chose the odd beer or odd cider out twice, which if you could do the quick math is exactly 33.33333%, which is exactly what you would expect by me guessing randomly. These ciders tasted identical to me. There was no difference in aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel to my perception, I could not pick up a difference whatsoever. Obviously, that's not what matters. What matters is what blind tasters are able to do. Now, the only thing that we did with this one differently than what we typically do with experiments is I let them know, hey, look, these are ciders. There's one thing different about them, and your job is to pick the one that's different. Uh, they're not beers, though. Don't I don't I didn't want them going in expecting to drink a beer and then to get hit with that juicy or apple you know flavor. Uh, so that is what I, I let them know. But they they had no idea what the variable was, what the comparison was, nothing like that. I served this cider uh, triangle test to 20 blind participants out of which 11 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us to say that there, you know, with some confidence that there is a meaningful difference between these. And in the end, just six people picked it. Uh, Six people out of 20 is just 30%. Again, by random guessing, we'd expect around 33%. So that's exactly what this is. We could say that these tasters just could not reliably tell these ciders apart regard. I mean, the fact that they cost so much different to me was really surprising when it yeah, came to these findings. Not, not just that, but they looked completely different in the bottles. Like they were objectively visually different. Um, even the fermentation was objectively visually different. You know, we saw the small bubbles versus the more of the Krausen, like the whole process looked, you know, very starkly different just based off of the color of the juices alone. Um, and, you know, and they probably were sourced from similar types of, you know, table apples and similar, similar types of sugar. But this really kind of does floor me that the, the cheap best yet versus the Trader Joe's, I mean, they, they were starkly observably, you know, observantly visually different. And yet you still could not tell them apart and neither could the participants. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating to me. Um, and you know, because of the fact, again, now, now, just a reminder for those who may not necessarily read the website articles as much as they do listen to this podcast, we, uh, our, our triangle tests are served in different colored cups that are opaque. You cannot see through these. So yeah, you can look down the top, but you've got a red, a blue, and a green cup that really do change the way anything that's in them looks. So tasters could not, ostensibly they could not uh, see the difference in the way these ciders looked. So they really were focused more on aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel. And again, they just could not tell them apart. 
which kind of implies that this cheap, at least cheap best yet apple juice, I don't know you know, if you're getting that uh, you know, great value stuff, uh, it can be used to produce a cider that's at the very least indistinguishable from one made using expensive, unfiltered Trader Joe's apple juice. Your money might be going to a different company, I get that, but uh, in the end, the result was pretty surprising and it was that they tasted the same. Uh, fascinating to me. Now, we got some reader comments on this one, and I think one that you were asking me about earlier, Will, before we started recording, is gonna. I, I'm gonna have to figure out a response to. Kent said, uh, "I wonder if the back sweetening drove the flavor. Same type of juice for each, right? Uh, as both attenuated so low, this might be the big driver in making these so similar. Perhaps if we invest more in the back sweetening juice, we might see a difference. Just a thought. Uh, Will, what say you? So I, I think this is totally fair. I'm interested to see like what led to your decision to want to back sweeten. Like I know back sweetening is a really common practice in cider making, especially if you're not into dry stuff. But you know, uh, there there is a, a fair question here to like you know what 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 made you go with the decision to back sweeten other than maybe just you like the taste better which is pretty good because you did have to drink you know 10 gallons of this stuff <laughs> yeah. and, and then you know um was there any consideration of maybe using like the trader joe's back sweetening versus the best yet back sweetening uh you know concentrates so i i think it's fair so no, I, it's absolutely fair, and uh, I, I totally see what Kent and the 14 other people <laughs> who commented on this uh, this topic here uh, are, 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 are coming from, you know, uh, that makes sense to me. The reason I chose to back sweeten it is just like you said, these were ciders that I was going to have around my house that I wanted my wife to enjoy, that I wanted my friends to come over and enjoy, and my typical process uh, is to back sweeten with two to three uh, cans of apple juice concentrate. And so my thinking in designing this recipe, which I think it was done, what was this, or designing this experiment like five, six years ago at this point, um, was, well, if this is my normal process and I'm curious to see if it's if it's worth spending more money on this nicer unfiltered juice, then I wanna see if it's worth it with my normal process because that's what I'm doing. I understand the argument though of, well, let's see without the back sweetening if there is something different because that amount of back sweetening maybe kind of hides any any subtle differences that were there. That being said, I didn't use uh, the best yet uh, uh, concentrate to back sweeten them. I actually went to a different store and bought um, some other brand. I think it was called Langer's or something. Uh, apple juice concentrate. It's kind of a nicer apple juice concentrate, I guess. Um, and I used that for both of them. So maybe that is what did it. And I and I think that opens up, you know. Uh, the opportunity for us to do another experiment in the future looking at something like this, nicer juice versus cheaper juice without back sweetening. So uh, with that said, because the question was asked so often, I think it's important to denote that, yes, this is a, a experiment where the implications basically are that it seems you can get away with using cheap juice uh, or expensive juice to get the same result when you're back sweetening with three cans of concentrate. So just to get that out there. Um, the next comment comes from Derek Pruitt, who says, I've wondered about this extensively. As many cider aficionados claim, you cannot use the processed stuff since it contains ascorbic acid, which affects the fermentation. I, I've never actually heard that, Will. Uh, what I always heard was don't use it if it has uh, sulfites or sorbate in it because that's what you use basically to knock fermentation out. Yeah, I'm in a similar boat. Uh, you know, people add ascorbic acid in beer brewing in the mash all the time uh, and, and in various parts of the process. So I, I don't think ascorbic acid is going to be the culprit here. It may affect the acidity some, uh, obviously, because it's, it's an acid. But I don't know that it would actually do much to affect, you know, the, the yeast itself. I'm with you. It's more of the sulfites and sorbates that I would be concerned with because those will um, retard fermentation. Yeah, exactly. We know that. We actually use those for that purpose. So final comment. Here's a fun one. Comes from Steve Snyder who says, yuck, at least you could have gotten some unpasteurized cider from a local farm, maybe made from real cider apples and not eating apples. I, that's not what I did, Steve, and I love the ciders I make with real eating apple juice, so... <laughs> Well, and, and you're like me, like, it's not like I have a, a local, um, you know, orchard that I can go down to and just pick right. whatever varieties I want. So part of it's a function of uh, necessity, you know, or, or just, you know, geography. So, um, like I said, top of the show, middle of the show, um, I would love to go frolic through an orchard and, you know, maybe March, we could get together. We could go hold hands and frolic <laughs> through an orchard and pick, pick various <laughs> apples of various, uh, tannin and sugar levels and acidities. And we can go make our own custom Marshall will blend of, of cider. Uh, but unfortunately, we would both have to fly somewhere to do that. And, uh, you know, we, and then we'd have to get whoever was uh, willing enough to ferment it out and package it for us to send us the bottles later. 
Life goals, Will. Life goals, man. That's that's where I'm at. But that does bring us to the end of this episode. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on using cheap or expensive juice to make cider before we wrap this one up? I, I think it's an admirable goal. I, I mean, yes, go out there, get the best stuff you can normally. And if that's what you're making, it's great. But I think it's an admirable goal to try to take the cheapest things you can find and still try to make award-winning ciders with it. I think that's something kind of in the notion of short and shoddy and some of those other things that we've, we've been doing, like to be able to take like, you know, best yet uh, ciders and then maybe try to make some things that might do well in competitions. I think that would be an admirable goal in my opinion. Yeah, and it's fun. And I think, you know, any hobby should be entertaining and fun. And that's that's what ultimately inspired me to try this. And the fact it worked out, hell, I mean, I, I love it. And I make a lot of cider and that's how I do it. And if you don't like it, then then more power to you. Do it do it the other way. That's totally fine with me. So, well, don't forget to check out the Brew Lab podcast where host Cade Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they're doing on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.